reach, inspire, and transform. NASM Optima 2021 Virtual Conference. Our biggest and best Optima yet. Three full days of learning. More than 100 virtual sessions. Inspiring speakers you can't miss. Challenging workouts to master your skills. Nutrition and lifestyle facts. The best community network. And for the first time ever, with free full online access. At Optima 2021. Find out more and register today. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're going to be talking about something called arthrokinematics. Arthrokinematics, which you may have seen before. As I'm looking up in my CES textbook, it is figure 2.8. And what it does is there's kind of this idea of neuromuscular control, and then it breaks down into three different segments. And those three segments are length tension relationship, force couple relationships, and arthrokinematics. And I think we've done force couple relationships and length tension relationships before, but we've not really talked about arthrokinematics. And uh, it's very specific. Arthrokinematics, understanding how arthro joints kinematics move, understanding how joints move. And this is not to be confused with osteokinematics, which is how our bones are moving. And when we talk about osteokinematics, we are talking about flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation. Those are osteokinematics, but understanding arthrokinematics, what's happening at the joint level. And that's a conversation I want to have with you today. So there, theoretically, when it comes to arthrokinematics, there are three things that can take place. There are three moves. Your joint can go through something called a roll. It can spin or it can glide or slide, depending on which text you're looking at. So some will say glide, some will say slide. And these are the three theoretical movements that can take place at a joint. And these three things don't necessarily take place at all joints. In fact, the spin of the roll, spin, and glide is not very common. So it doesn't take place a lot. There are several bone or joints that it takes place in, like the radial ulnar joint. As you go into pronation and supination at the wrist, there is a roll of the radius and the ulna. So the ulna stays still and not a roll, a spin. So there's a spin of the radius as it goes over the ulna. So spin is not one that takes place a lot. So the other two, roll and glide, Happen, happen quite a bit, happen a lot of joints in the body. So we can think about this. We can use uh, a golf ball, which I don't have, I can't find, I have it not for the purpose of playing golf, but I have it for the purpose of rolling the bottom of my foot. So I use a golf ball for that, which I couldn't find. So I found this ball instead. And for those of you who are uh, listening to the podcast, not watching it on Facebook or YouTube, I'm just holding up an inflatable ball, some toy of one of my children. And the other thing that I don't have is a golf tee, but I do have that triangle peg game where you hop over the golf tees and that you can find it like Cracker Barrel but I don't know where that is. So the golf tee was out of the question. So I took the battery out of my Hypervolt. And so this is going to serve as my golf tee. And I'm going to set a golf ball on top of the tee. And that's what it looks like, right? So here are your moves. There is a roll. And so if you watch this happen, I'm going to have the ball roll on the golf tee. But the problem is it doesn't roll very far because if it just rolls a little bit, it rolls off of the golf tee. 
So that's not good. We do not want our joints to do that. That seems awful. So for instance, if I take my arm up over above my head, then there is a rolling that takes place, but there's also a glide that's going to take place. So as the ball rolls off the golf tee, you can actually think about it. Well, now it needs to glide or slide. So it's going to roll and it's going to glide inside of that socket. So for instance, I also tell people, um, maybe they're on the treatment table at the gym and I'm doing stretches with them or I'm doing some type of body work as a licensed therapist. And I might say, all right, go ahead and roll over. So they roll on top of the, the massage or the treatment table, but they inherently spin because if all they did was roll over, they would just roll right off the top of the table. So they also have to spin in, not spin, glide on top of it as they roll. I'm going to keep using spin. I'm so sorry. Spin takes place at very few joints. So remember the radial ulnar joint. So rolling and gliding. So as they roll, they glide in place. And that's important because think about uh, the knee. So the knee goes into flexion. If all it did was roll, then the heads of those two bones, the femur and the tibial plateau, they would lose contact with each other. And what happens is that those condyles of the femur have to stay inside of the meniscus of the tibia plateau. And so actually when flexion takes place at the knee, it will look like this. You'll see it roll, but then it stays. It's just gliding across the surface as it rolls and it stays within the joint. Well, when we connect that, remember with that figure 2.8 in the CES, it's also in your CPT textbook. I just don't know where it is. Uh, it's important because we look at neuromuscular efficiency and it's highly connected with the length tension relationship and force couple relationships. And length tension and force coupling give the rolling, spinning, and gliding um, its, its substance. It gives it its fortitude. It allows it to have its optimal movement. And if length tension is off and force couplings are off, then the joint kinematics cannot appropriately move within that joint. So you don't get the appropriate roll. Or you might get too much roll and not enough gliding, and then it leads to pinching. So think about things like reaching your arm over your head. All right, you reach your arm over your head. Here, let me put my textbook away. As you reach your arm over your head and the humerus is in the glenoid fossa, as the arm reaches overhead, there is a rolling, but it's got to glide inside that fossa. So it has to stay inside of that tiny little glenoid fossa that's there. What also has to happen, and this is problematic, is that maybe rolling and gliding is okay at the shoulder joint, but the force coupling at the scapula, as you go into upward rotation, when you reach overhead, the scapula is not moving correctly. And so if the scapula is not moving, then you're going to roll and you're going to glide right into the, the supraspinatus tendon or into the muscle itself. And you can create uh, some type of sh shearing or uh, tearing eventually over time. Or if it's a big movement, quick and abrupt, then some damage can take place just without many uh, iteration. So it doesn't have to happen over and over again. It can happen once and you can cause damage. So that's an overuse injury. Overuse can happen over time or it can happen one time and it's a big deal. So rolling, spinning, and gliding, understanding arthro kinematics are important to help us understanding movement. So think about this. If you've ever done a calf stretch or your client has done a calf stretch and they've felt pinching at the front of their ankle. 
So the anterior portion of the ankle as they're dorsiflexing and they get a pinch at the front of the ankle. Well, one of the reasons that happens, you might say tight calves, and I would agree with you that tight calves are problematic, but the big issue with this is that they can't stretch their calves because the calves creates pinching and remember this forever in your life. Pinching in joints is never good. So you don't say, oh, if only, let me stretch this muscle and stretch into a pinch and then say, ah, but I really need to stretch this muscle. So I'll just suffer through the pinch to get the stretch. Not the right answer. That's not the right answer. So if they go into this calf stretch and they get the pinching at the front of the ankle and they go, oh man, this is terrible because uh, I'm going to catch 22. My my ankle's pinching because my calves are tight, but I can't stretch my calves because the pinching. And you start to get into the cycle. Well, what's happening? Now, that is a glide issue. We talked about rolling, spinning, and gliding or sliding. So in dorsiflexion, if you think of your foot, and then you've got the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. Above the calcaneus is a bone called the talus or talus. And that talus bone, as you go into dorsiflexion, as you dorsiflex, so my, my top hand, if you're watching, my top hand is representing the talus. My bottom hand with my fingers extended is representing my foot. As I go into dorsiflexion, the talus, if the talus doesn't move, it's going to pinch. And you can kind of see how some pinching would take place. So what happens in dorsiflexion, the talus is supposed to slide backwards. And as it slides backwards, it allows for dorsiflexion to take place more fully. If it doesn't slide backwards, it creates an impingement, the pinching that takes place at the front of the ankle. I used to have this significantly, and it would travel. So I'd have it on the anterior. Sometimes it would be underneath my medial malleolus. Sometimes it'd be underneath the lateral malleolus. Most of the time, it'd be in the anterior, right where the talus isn't moving. And man, it would be a lot of pinching. So foam rolling would help, and I think that's important to know that foam rolling and then going to your stretching might be um, supportive. Uh, sometimes what would happen is I would have to do some plantar flexion and then dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, and try to mobilize the slide of the talus. Eventually what I had to do is go to physical therapy. And this was years ago, and I've been seeing the same physical therapist pretty much since the beginning. His name is Pete Schultz, Dynamic Sports Physical Therapy in New York City. And Pete has been not just a friend, but a fantastic physical therapist throughout the years. And he would do a talus mobilization. And that's what was important to me is I actually needed to get some manual work. And then once he was able to get the glide to take place in the talus. Then I was able to dorsiflex and stretch the calves, getting that pinching bone out of the way as it glided posteriorly and allowed me to get a stretch. All right, so now let's review it one more time. And I know sometimes I messed it up as we were talking, so let me clarify. Arthro kinematics and that figure 2.8 in your CES, it's also in your textbook for the, your CPT, you just don't, uh, I didn't look it up. Uh, I did look it up because my, my CES text was close by, and you've got this, this chart, this figure that says optimal neuromuscular efficiency. And if you've got optimal neuromuscular efficiency, then you must have optimal length tension relationship, force couple relationships, and arthro, kinematics. And so if you got those three things, then that will also allow for optimal sensory motor integration, optimal neuromuscular efficiency, and optimal tissue recovery. And that, again, this is our, our figure in the textbook. That's what it looks like. And those three things, oh, boom, boom, and boom there. If I pointed them out to you, the joint, normal joint arthrokinematics, it's the ability for that joint, not osteokinematics, ab adduction, all of that stuff, 
it is rolling, spinning, and gliding or sliding. Those are your three movements that take place in our theoretical understanding of arthrokinematics. All right, uh, that's it. That's all I want to talk to you about today. Just an overview and understanding something that is in our textbooks that goes along with uh, length tension relationships. It goes along with force coupling, which we talk about ad nauseum sometimes. And then there's arthrokinematics and people go, all right, that must be flexion, extension, ab adduction. It's not. It's what takes place at the joint, not how the angles of the bones are in relationship to a plane of motion. So rolling, spinning, and gliding or sliding for joint arthrokinematics. If you have questions about it, um, you can reach out to me and I'll try to get some a bit more clarity to you, but that one is uh, uh, at a real high level, these three movements to help understand what's going on there. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so on Instagram. DM me at dr.rickrichie, R-I-C-H-E-Y. You can email me at rick.richie at nasm.org. Thank you so much for joining me on this one. I appreciate you listening in. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.